Okay guys, this is the uh, second video in the series, I guess. Um, just doing a little bit on load development for the 7mm Weatherby. I'll get, I'll give you a little story, I guess, of how I got into it. Um, when I was 17, my Opa gave me all of his reloading equipment for the 7mm Weatherby. And that's pretty much all he had. He had, he had a few um, shotgun reloading kits, like the Lee Loader. And he had, he also went out and bought himself a press, uh, a set of dies, full length sizing dies, and a case trimmer, and he had a scale, and that kind of stuff. And he did, he actually had a can of the original powder. I think I still have it here. I might have it out in my shop, but um, I didn't use that old powder um, just because it was so old. I don't know if it had ever been wet or if there's condensation or anything. He did live down in the Kootenays for a long time. It's high humidity down there, and I don't know. Um, it was open powder, and yes, I trusted my grandpa, but I don't know if the old powder is the same as the new stuff, so I ended up throwing that out. But anyway, getting into it, I didn't really... Um, it wasn't really something that I was interested in. Uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been something that I picked up on my own... If I could have bought factory ammunition, I think I probably would still be shooting that stuff because it's a lot easier than reloading. Uh, just going in, going into local outdoor stores and stuff and looking at all the reloading components, it was like a jungle. It was just, it was really foreign to me. I didn't understand it, but I had worked with a few guys that had done lots of reloading and they, they seemed really into it. Like it was a great hobby for them and... Um, I thought, oh, that's, that's cool. Well, have fun with your hobby, but I never wanted to do it for myself. So I had all this reloading equipment after I moved out of my parents, and for some reason I, I hung on to it. I didn't throw it out. And it followed me here for about 10 years, and um, eventually I got into it, and I thought, man, I can't believe I ever got into this. So um, about four or five years ago, I ended up going on an elk hunt, and... When I was packing up my stuff, I realized, oh, wow, this is great. I don't have any ammunition. So I went down to the local outdoor store here, and I asked for a couple boxes of 7mm Weatherby. And they said, oh, we, it doesn't look like we have any. Sorry. And I thought, no way. You don't have any? Are you sure? No, there's 7mm Remington, STW, uh, Remington Ultra Mag, and... They didn't have any Weatherby, and I thought, no way. So I went to a town that's a little bit farther away from here, about 40 minutes away. Um, we were going there anyways for a, for a car appointment for my girlfriend's car. And I checked there, and they didn't have anything. And then I kind of started to panic, because hunting season was a week away, and I didn't have any ammunition for my rifle. So I started phoning around. Um, one day at lunchtime, I ended up phoning around down to Surrey and different places down south and I started asking um, asking all the retailers if they had any um, 7mm ammunition so Vancouver, Surrey, Abbotsford, Maple Ridge um, all these places down south and I checked with the interior in BC and I checked with everywhere in Alberta and it was like a curse for some reason I could not find this stuff anywhere so <clears throat> The last place that I phoned um, was a place called Nachaco Outdoors in uh, Vanderhoof. Now, I thought that they'd had a store in Prince George, which they did, but when I went down there, um, they, had, they were just, I guess, closing the store in Prince George, and they were moving to Vanderhoof. And I thought, oh great, where's Vanderhoof? So we ended up driving seven and a half hours and I got them to put a hold on the last two boxes of 7mm uh, Weatherby in 154 Interbond. So um, we made the trip seven and a half hours there, stayed, um, came back and I was able to go hunting that year. So long story short, I said I am never ever ever doing that again and that's how I got into reloading. So um, from that day, um, I lined up my rifle, used one box of shells, and then I said, no, I'm not going to shoot these other ones. So I pulled the uh, I pulled the components, and I decided I'm going to start reloading. So I put the dies into the press, and um, I watched a quick YouTube video on how to on how to reload uh, rifle ammunition, and I got to it, started trying things on my own, and 
I screwed up all 20 cases on the first first try and the last case that I put in number 20 I got stuck it was stuck in the in the die and I couldn't get it out then I was frustrated and I thought what the hell am I doing wrong uh, I was pissed off and couldn't figure out what I did so I had to go get a, a, a stuck case remover and I had to pull the case out and the brass tore and then I had to put my mechanic skills to use. I had to get the case out of the stupid die. And um, that was when I realized that the old typical man thing of not reading instructions before you're about to do something. That's when I realized that I'd pulled that old trick. So um, after ruining those 20 cases, and I knew I couldn't find any um, any other empty brass or anything in town. So... Um, before I started actually getting it really into reloading, I started picking up components. So I don't know if 284 is a really popular caliber or if it was just a curse, but I could not find components for it for a long time. Um, after that year that I found the ammunition, the next year I had actually already started reloading. I had my hand loads for hunting and stuff, so I was pretty happy. But all that spring, um, after I'd found, I went to wholesale sports before they closed closed their doors. And I ended up buying quite a few boxes of uh, empty brass. There's 100 in here of 7mm Weatherby. Um, this row, these two rows here are the Hornady um, brass. I ended up finding one more box. So these are some of the uh, the ones that I picked up in Vanderhoof. And there's a few here that are uh, other ones from before. And the rest of them, all this weather be haven't been touched. They're brand new, out of the box, haven't been fired yet. And same with this box here. I haven't fired them yet. They're brand new, out of the box. So I was pretty lucky to come across all this stuff. I know that you can um, you can make your own cases um, out of other brass. I wasn't really interested in doing that. It didn't have the right head stamp on it and stuff. So I just thought, no, I'm not interested. I'm going to have the real McCoy. I'm going to do it right. And then if I ever do pass the rifle down, there's no confusion. Nothing's nothing's going to be confusing anybody that reloads it. And it really is a safer way to do it. So <laughs> I was lucky enough to pick that stuff up. And then some of the components, uh, the reloading components, these are just rounds that I carry with me in the bush um, in the fall, in and out of the rifle in the morning and at night when we come back from our hunts and stuff. So these are all loaded. These are all loaded the same. It's just what I pack with me in the bush. Pretty handy just to throw them in your bag. That's my that's my extra rounds that I keep in my pack. They haven't been touched yet, really, um, after being clean and stuff in the tumbler. So those ones haven't been used at all. Brand new brass. Um, these ones just kind of a mix match. They're all the same. They're all loaded the same. Uh, 78 grains of retumbo over Federal 215 Magnum primers and <clears throat> basically. I don't shoot a lot anymore out of my 7mm. I don't really want to shoot the barrel out, so I don't know how many rounds have actually gone through it. I can't say that there's been over a thousand rounds through it. Um, Opa wasn't a big shooter because it did cost money, and he was a frugal German. I don't believe that he shot it very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the fall, um, <clears throat> he was kind of a pack rat. He kept he kept a lot of stuff. Uh, he kept all the original uh, paperwork for the rifle, all the original cards and stuff. Um, his, um, I think he threw the box out, and he was saying that at my at my graduation when he gave me the rifle. He's like, I'm sorry, but I think I threw the box out. <laughs> but um, he pretty pretty much kept everything else. So every fall he would go out and he would shoot a few shots into a paper, and he kept the paper with him. Um, and when he passed away, I had the really sad chore of cleaning out his his den and seeing if I wanted anything from it, and really didn't, I can't say I really took anything of value. His rifles were all really old, and I actually ended up giving a couple to my sister, and there's a really old one there that he had made a stock for. And um, anyways, I'm kind of getting off topic here, but um, yeah, he he didn't shoot a lot, so I'm, I can't say that more than a 1,000 rounds came out of that rifle. So this is just one of the hand loads. I guess I'll probably put that away too. Um, they're all loaded the same, so I don't have to worry if I pick up one of these rounds. I know that they haven't, that they're all loaded the same. So I guess that's one more important thing that if you have bullets that look alike, make sure that you clearly label everything. These ones here, I know from memory, these are 154 SSTs that I've loaded for the 7mm, 
and they are loaded with 7828 super shortcut. Um, these are the identical powder charge in here of 7828, except these are the interbonds. Um, excellent bullet. If I wasn't shooting the partitions, um, I'd like to try the A frame as well. But if I wasn't shooting either of those two, this would be my next bullet, uh, the 154 interbond. So those are a couple of the rounds that I have. Um, I'm, I got really into reloading really fast. Um, you can see these things behind these rounds are sharpening stones. They're all Arkansas stones. And I guess that's another hobby that I got into really quickly. Um, but I believe if you're going to do anything, anything that I do in life is all in or nothing at all. I don't just put one foot in, I'm all in. So it was pretty much the same with reloading. I got as much knowledge and information uh, that I could from reading books and watching videos here on YouTube of different guys reloading. So um, I did have that information to go by, which is extremely helpful. And, um, you know, you, you have that knowledge base that you can work with. So starting starting reloading, um, I had empty brass with me. Um, I, had, I had actually 100 more rounds than I have now. Um, but they're in various reloads and stuff like this, so they have scattered a bit. I always save my brass after I've shot something. Uh, and, yeah, so the first day I started reloading, I had I had 20 rounds of Hornady ammunition. Then I had a couple mixed ones, like the Federal that I'd shot. Um, I had a couple mixed rounds. And I, basically, I screwed the die into the vise, and I watched a YouTube video of a guy doing reloading. And he explained it all. And so I was going to I was gonna figure out how to do it on my own, so I screwed my die into my vise here, and I put my first case in after lubricating it, and it worked, and I put the second one, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then the eighth or the ninth or tenth one, whatever it was, um, I pulled it out, and there's a bunch of dimpling on it, around the, just around the shoulder here, the case, by the neck, and I thought, well, what's that from? And I figured out, well, it's too much lube on the case neck. So it took me a while to figure that one out. So I had to, I had to Google that one too. Isn't Google our friend, right? So I pulled it out. And so I thought, well, I won't put as much lube on this one. So I guess I didn't pull it, put enough lube on it. And I got the case stuck. So that was another adventure. Um, I had to go buy a stuck case remover. Unfortunately, that didn't work. Because before I tried the stuck case remover, I tried my Leatherman and a pair of needle nose pliers. Which ended up scratching the reloading dies because I'm an idiot and I ended up having to buy a new set of full length sizing dies and <clears throat> screwing those into my vise and then learning a whole lot more I pulled the typical man thing of not reading the instructions before I use the tool so um, I ended up learning a lot more before I started doing um, after that reloading went very smooth um, one of the more important things, I think probably the most important thing, if you want to be if you want to be successful at reloading, follow the book. Um, it's all about measurements and consistency in your reloading and of course following directions. So you have all of these measurements in here. They do not change. The measurements in this book here um, they are somewhat different. Uh, the next size here is 0.314 inches. Uh, the next size here is 0 0.307 inches. Uh, but the case, like the head and everything here, will not change. Um, I shouldn't say that. It does change. It does change somewhat. The cases do change over time. Very, very, very minimal. But one thing that does change over time is the powders. Um, when you're reloading, powders do change. So the 48, the IMR 4831 of 40 years ago is not the same IMR 4831 of today and you can look you can just compare data in these two different books and you, these are just two different books um, the 4831 uh, recently lists 3200 feet per second at 73 grains uh, 3200 feet per second with the old 4831 is 71.9 grains so um, <laughs> it is a big difference Oh, sorry, that was H4831. I'm all screwed up. 69 grains brings you to 3,800 or 3,200 feet per second, and 71.9 grains brings you to 
3200 feet per second so probably a pretty good idea don't use these old books for reloading you can keep them for reloading memories or whatever if, if, if they've been handed down to you but please don't take the data out of these old books and use them for newer rifle car cartridges or chamberings or whatever just go out, spend the 40 50 dollars buy yourself a book new updated data it's worth your life don't use these old ones so i i didn't try a max charge with the imr 4831 but that actually is a pretty big difference when you think um 67 grains to 73 so 63 being your minimum and then 73 being your max it doesn't seem like a lot but it really is it's you're dealing with high pressures lots of pressure in there and just a little bit of powder will make a difference so scrap these old books don't pay attention to them keep them for memories whatever but don't use them for reloading even if you do have the powder that comes with the book <laughs> So when I started, this was the book that I used. Um, these are a couple of powders that I started using uh, when I first started out. I started with IMR 4831. Um, I did quite a few ladder tests with the 4831, and I did get some really, really deadly results with it. Um, I was touching, I was touching basically in the same hole with the 4831, but the velocity was not really where I wanted it to be. And I mean, it was plenty for whatever I needed it for, but because I'm really picky, I just didn't, I didn't settle for it. So after that powder, um, I went to the 7828, and then finally I ended up with Retumbo. Um, the Retumbo was what I wanted to use for, whoops, for whatever reason, I was just stuck on this Retumbo because <clears throat> I thought, oh, that's a really neat looking powder, and... It had the 7mm Remington um, ballistics and stuff on here, and I was really interested in using it. And then the H1000 was kind of an afterthought. Um, I heard it worked really well, and it had 7mm um, load data on there as well. So I picked this up a little bit later. <clears throat> but more extensively, I did testing with 7828 and Retumbo. Um, I bought quite a bit of Retumbo after I found my load for the 160 partition. Um, 7828, I did go through a lot of this powder too. I believe I burnt uh, two pounds, I guess, of 7828 or three pounds of 7828 um, coming up with a, a round for that rifle. And um, I ended up settling with Tomo because that's what worked for me. So <clears throat> I was having a heck of a time. There was one more powder that I tried and I believe it was IMR 4350. I didn't have any good results with that one. Um, my bullets were flying all over the chart. So I ended up scrapping that powder. I believe I had like a quarter of a pound left and I just took it out in the backyard and burnt it. So um, <clears throat> didn't have any really good results for 4350. It might have been because um, the 4350 is a faster burning powder compared to these guys. So scrapped it, didn't use it. Stuck with the 7828 and the Retumble and I had really good results with both. This one was probably the best result that I did have, but the velocity was low, so I scrapped that one too. <clears throat> um, talking about reloading, when you get into it, like I said, it's about measurement, and you got to pay attention to details, and your weight, um, your, your charge for your powders, everything, you have to follow the instructions, make sure you're within the SAMI specs of all your cartridges, and double check everything pay attention to detail like crazy like there's no room for errors in this game I take it pretty seriously um, I don't really think losing a an eye or a hand or an arm or anything would be that much fun so I do wear safety glasses when I reload you can tell I haven't reloaded for a long time these things are really dusty but I do wear safety glasses when I reload um, I pulled quite a few um, pulled quite a few rounds with this hammer it's pretty well used to um, they basically wear my safety glasses for the whole thing. As soon as I start putting primers in, that's when I start to wear my safety glasses and um, yeah, basically stay safe, pay attention, and basically yeah, have fun with it. So the first step is make sure your cartridges are clean. Clean them out really well with a brush. Uh, your primer pockets, don't neglect them. Take your primer pocket cleaner, clean them out, scrape them up. 
and then shine a light into your cases make sure there's nothing wrong with the cases inside check your case next do an inspection of every single case that you put through your tumbler after they come out inspect every single one of them take the time to do it right um, make sure everything is how it's supposed to be you don't want to take shortcuts with this stuff guys so double check everything before you start putting powder and primers and stuff and everything into it and you should be you should have a long happy life of shooting ahead of you um, starting with case prep so after you've cleaned everything um, you're gonna put your primers in uh, this rifle I had did I, I started out using uh, CCI 250 Magnum primers and for whatever reason my rifle did not respond well to the 250 um, CCI primers and that was kind of a it's kind of a turning point like I would get groups but they would be within three inches I wasn't happy with that so um, that's when I changed powders um, changing powders didn't seem to help and it was just like night and day like as soon as I changed powders or primers to the from the 250 to the 215 Federal I had way better results for whatever reason so I changed to the Federal uh, 215 primers the Magnum primers and they were excellent so that's what I started that's what I ended up using for uh, the majority of my loads was 215 Magnum uh, Federal primers so when you're seating your primers in there um, you'll notice if they're not seated in there enough make sure you're seating them all the same that you're putting pressure uh, enough pressure on whatever you're loading if you're using a hand loader you can use a hand loader or you can use the reloading dies which is what I, or the reloading um, arm this little thing here well you can't see it because it's off camera but I've just got an RCBS uh, JR3 press and that's what I use is just that little priming arm in there and you can tell um, if you do them all at once if you have them all prepped you can prime them all at once with the primer tube throw your primer tube in there make sure all your primers are one way which is this little primer flipper here pretty handy it costs like two bucks and you throw all your primers in here and you just wiggle them around and those little sharp edges will catch the rings in there and it flips them all for you so you can stick your primer tube um, you can stick stick your primer tube onto this thing here and you can just stick it on there and it'll pick up all the primers for you you don't have to flip them by hand so you don't have to handle them so much <clears throat> which is better so you don't have a misfire or whatever or, or a hang load or hang fire after you prime them um, set them all up in a reloading tray like this this is one of the ones that I've got um, set them up in a reloading tray and if you can you can do you can space them out like this if you're only doing 20 rounds at a time or whatever and when you're loading your powder charges um, I don't you wouldn't really be able to do it with a weather bee because your case would be overflowing with powder but double charges pay attention to what you're doing don't be listening to music and talking on the phone and texting while you're doing this stuff because it's pretty easy to miss if you're loading a different rifle chambering other than 7mm whatever you're loading um, pay attention to what you're doing so when you put your powder charges in here I always measure my powder charges twice um, I'll put them on the scale and then I'll put them in a different pan and then I'll put the pan back on there and double check and make sure that they're good and then I'll dump them in the funnel and um, I'll do that for each one of them and then my bullets I inspect them to make sure um, there's no defects in them before I put them in and I'll do everything all in one step so I'll prime and then I'll put my, my primers in and then I'll stick them all in here and then I'll measure all my powders I'll put all my powder charges in and then I set my die for the bullet seat and then I, I seat them all at once to the exact same um, seating depth in accordance with with the book here <clears throat> so that's basically that's pretty much all I can tell you about um, reloading is just consistency make sure you're following the rules and everything and whatever whatever rifle you're loading for find out as much information as you can about it and one of the reasons that I said that I would post this is because there really wasn't much about the 7mm Weatherby it was kind of an oddball cartridge and I did a lot of research uh, read a lot of articles bought a lot of books trying to figure out stuff about this one of the most handy um, books that I did buy was the Nosler um, reloading reloading guide number six and there's a little write-up in here about I guess I don't know just 
promoting their 7mm uh, weather beer or whatever it is. So <clears throat> the right up in here it gives a little story and then it gives a little bit of information on the case. So uh, the bullet choices for the 7mm weather be you can go from 110 grain up to 175 grain. And it says, as with most Weatherby Magnums, there are a few points to keep in mind while loading for this cartridge. The chambers have free bore, meaning they have a longer throat. For this reason, it is generally not possible to seat a bullet close to or in contacts with the lands or the rifling. So with the 7mm, and when, you're, when you go to shoot these things, they have a split second in time where they're fired, where they're not touching anything. They're not touching the rifling lands or the lands on the rifling uh, it's not like they're suspended in space but um it's not like a normal like a ramming a 7mm remington you can load and you can have it a couple foul right off the lands so that your bullet is started in the rifling so it starts it starts that process of spinning right away um these enter the chamber i shouldn't say at random but the way I've, I've read it and the way it's been explained to me with Weatherby cartridges is, is they kind of, <laughs> if I can find the right word for it, um, they kind of enter the rifling off center and they make their, they don't make their own path obviously because it would destroy your rifle, but they don't enter the, um, the lands the same way as a Remington or whatever would, which, which means, um, with these, with the Weatherby chamberings, you can seat this bullet out as far as your magazine will allow, is what they say. Um, I stuck fairly close to the Sammy specs for the cartridge just because um, I didn't want to blow my head off. And I didn't know that until I bought this book. And it, it says here, um, because of the case capacity, powders having a burn rate equal to or slower than IMR4831 will yield the best results. And that's... I found that for myself to be true. Um, the slower powders, the ultra slow burning powders, um, 78, 28, retumble, um, those were the best performing powders in my rifle. And 48, 31 was a good powder, but the retumble ultimately, um, it was the best uh, best powder that I found in combination with the 160 partition. So um, <clears throat> basically, you have to try different stuff, different recipes. Buy the reloading books. Um, try different stuff. Don't be scared to go out to the range and shoot 30, 40 rounds at once. And then keep a log of what you're shooting, what your powders are, what the results are. Um, take pictures and take a pencil with you. When you go out and check your results, write down what load it was with your pen. Circle your groups. And then when you find that good load, go back home. Prep your cases the exact same way that you did before and go out there again and double check your load to see if you get the same results. But don't just load three rounds. Load six rounds of that same load or load nine rounds to make absolutely sure that, that the load that you tested, that it wasn't um, something that you were doing unintentionally while you were shooting if you're making a shooting error or whatever it is. <clears throat> so um, I guess I'll do a part three. I get kind of long-winded doing these things because there's a lot of information to take in. So I'll do a part three of this video. Um, and if you guys want to watch it, uh, you can watch it. But I'll post it up here right after this one. So thanks for watching. Uh, really appreciate, really appreciate your support. So um, watch out for part three. Thanks.